In this video, we'll discuss how to make evidence-based decisions. When was the last time you heard the phrase evidence-based? If you are like me, you'll hear it a lot, if not on a daily basis. What does evidence mean? Should you trust evidence? Is it the same to trust science and trust evidence? What to do when you have conflicting evidence? Should you trust the experts fully without a shred of doubt? We'll try to answer these questions in this video. And I summarize the answers into seven things that leaders need to know about evidence-based decision-making. Hopefully, this video will help you become evidence-savvy. First, what is evidence? According to dictionary, evidence is the available body of information indicating whether a belief or proposition is true or valid. The phrase evidence-based was coined in the field of medicine as recently as the early 1990s when many doctors' practice was based on their experience, anecdote, and unscientific research. Based on evidence, doctors were recommended to treat high blood pressure to reduce the risk of heart disease. The phrase evidence-based was then adopted in the field of education, particularly education policy and educational leadership. The first thing leaders need to know about evidence-based decision-making is that no evidence has 100% certainty. If a piece of evidence is presented with 100% certainty, be on your guard. Many scientists were involved in the launch of spacecrafts to Mars, but no one can predict the success of launch with 100% certainty. When someone presents the evidence with 100% certainty, you need to stay alert, particularly when the evidence from a single source is presented in a way that makes you angry or overjoyed. Strong emotions create mental shortcuts for decision makers, so they can make decisions that are influenced by affect bias without evaluating whether the evidence is valid or not. The essence of science is to remove uncertainty. Scientists propose theories and develop hypotheses to explain phenomena in the world. Scientists apply a variety of scientific methods to produce evidence to support, reject, or modify theories or hypotheses. If the theories are rejected, then scientists propose new theories. Another cycle of scientific process begins. As a result, the scientific process is a process to remove uncertainty, to be less wrong, and to be closer to truth. Aristotle wanted to know how human body and mind worked. He performed a lot of dissections and noted that humans had a unique rational soul powering rational will, thought, and reflection, which set us apart from animals. He also thought the rational soul was in the organ of heart. Fast forward to the 17th century, René Descartes, a rationalist, wanted to rationally figure out the true nature of being. He tried to remove uncertainty in everything he could possibly doubt. He said, if you would be a real seeker after truth, it is necessary that at least once in your life you doubt, as far as possible, all things. It turned out he could find a way to doubt just about everything. He doubted, would the sun rise the next day? In the process of doubting, he famously said, I think, therefore I am. Influenced by Aristotle's thought about the rational soul, Descartes separated soul from body. Currently, scientists are exploring how neurons, which relay the message to the next neuron, can collectively generate consciousness, which is the awareness of our thoughts, 
desires, emotions, and feelings about the world, others, and ourselves. Evidence is not set in stone. At any given moment, you may have conflicting evidence in front of you. You always check and double check the evidence used to support the claim. You update your decision once evidence converges. With the ongoing scientific process, each piece of new evidence is added to the body of evidence. The body of evidence evolves, so does your decision. An example is the evolution of the evidence about how the effectiveness of wearing face mask in reducing the spread of COVID-19. When people say trust science, it does not necessarily mean trust evidence. It's better to trust the scientific process and follow the evidence. To follow the evidence, you need to check the source. Can you find the original source of the evidence instead of a generic description of research says or science says? The second thing leaders need to know about evidence-based decision-making is that evidence can be cherry-picked. People tend to search for and interpret evidence in a way that validates a predetermined assumption or conclusion. We see what we want to see. This tendency is called confirmation bias. We selectively place trust in the information that is aligned with our preferences and beliefs, but selectively dismiss the information that is misaligned with our assumptions. If you are against the vaccines, you are more likely to selectively pay attention to the evidence supporting the alleged link between vaccines and autism and dismiss other evidence. If you support vaccines, you think the evidence of the link between vaccines and autism is ludicrous and focus on the evidence showing the benefits of vaccines. Evidence can be cherry-picked to reinforce our assumptions and preferences. A recent example is that in a Senate hearing on federal response to COVID-19, Dr. Anthony Fauci refuted Senator Rand Paul's claim that Sweden let everybody get infected and they have much lower death rate than the United States. In a later interview, Dr. Fauci said, I am not going to let him get away with saying things that are cherry-picked data. Dr. Fauci added, you are comparing apples and oranges. You should not be comparing Sweden with the United States. You should be comparing Sweden with demographically similar populations, like the Scandinavian countries such as Norway and Denmark. And Sweden has done much less well, particularly regarding death, compared to other countries. Language, statistical figures, and data visualizations can mislead decision makers. They can be presented to distract decision makers from what's really going on. Pay attention to how the evidence is presented. Did the presenter zoom in too much? Did the presenter zoom out too much? Is the evidence conveyed accurately? Take a look at this line graph that shows how effective Program X has been over the years. The data were collected in a different organization. How does this piece of evidence influence your decision of whether to implement Program X in your organization? If you cherry pick the evidence from 2008 to 2011, you can justify your decision of not implementing the program. But if you cherry pick the evidence from 2018 to 2020, you may want to implement the program as soon as possible. And you ignore the years when the program actually had a negative impact on the organizational outcome. When you cherry pick evidence, you can come up with evidence to prove anything. People also tend to see that the development of a phenomenon follows straight lines. 
looking at the trends from a broader context, you may find the trends are exponential, S-shaped, or hump-shaped. You may believe the relationship between leadership and organizational performance follows a straight line. It is true to some extent. Such a relationship can also follow the trend of being exponential, S-shaped or hump-shaped, or even inverted U-shaped. Again, when you cherry pick evidence, you can come up with evidence to prove anything. The third thing leaders need to know about evidence-based decision making is that evidence can be distorted. Evidence can be distorted to mislead decision makers. When you evaluate a claim of an association between two variables, it is good practice for you to see whether a scatter plot of all data points is presented. A scatter plot is a type of graph that displays variables of a data set. A scatter plot can reveal evidence that is sometimes buried or ignored by decision makers. For example, what you see on the screen is a scatter plot. The x-axis represents the revenue per student, and the y-axis represents the expenditure per student. That is how much money a district spends on each student. This graph only plots the data of the 100 largest school districts in 2017. The average expenditure per student in the 100 largest school district was $10,708. If you are in District A, you probably think your district did well because your district spent more dollars on your students than the average of 100 larger school districts. Without a scatter plot, you may not pay attention to the evidence that when on average, the district spent 86% of the revenue, but District A spent only 49%. Where did 51% of the district revenue go? District A is an obvious outlier. There are two districts that invested a lot of financial resources. They spent over $20,000 per student. New York City School District spent $25,199 per student in 2017, followed by Boston City Schools, $22,292. On the other end of the scatter plot, you see clusters of districts C and D. There are districts in cluster C that spent no more than $7,000 per student in the same year. Without a scatter plot, whoever presents the data can easily hide evidence or distort evidence. It takes less effort to lie without data, but there are many ways to lie with data. Look out for misleading evidence and how the evidence is presented. The fourth thing leaders need to know about evidence-based decision-making is that even the same evidence can be interpreted differently. We all have different upbringings, experiences, and preferences. This is why different people can interpret the same evidence very differently in addition to confirmation bias we discussed earlier. Take an example of how people interpreted the age of former President Reagan. When Reagan was in the debate in 1984, he was 73. If re-elected, Reagan would become the oldest sitting president in the U.S. history. The 2020 election will break this record no matter which party's candidate wins the election. At the moment, Trump is 74 and Biden is 77. In Reagan's debate, when the moderator asked Reagan if age was a concern in the election, Reagan famously replied, I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit it for political purposes, my opponent's youth and inexperience. His opponent, Mondale, was 56.
Many people in education know a nation at risk is an important document in American educational history. The report was released in 1983. It compared American education with that of other countries and concluded that the American educational system was failing to meet the national needs for a competitive workforce. Recall confirmation bias which is people's tendency to search for and interpret evidence in a way that validates a predetermined assumption or conclusion. The confirmation bias not only influences where we go to collect the evidence, but also how we interpret the evidence. The report A Nation at Risk was interpreted very differently by Democrats and Republicans. Democrats argue that the country's educational problems demanded more federal funding and federal control over schools. Republicans argue that the report was an indictment of past federal programs and education policies and called for eliminating federal influence and converting federal education funding into block grants or vouchers. The same evidence in the report was interpreted very differently by two political parties. The fifth thing leaders need to know about evidence-based decision-making is that not all evidence is created equal. There is strong evidence and there is weak evidence. You saw program Y has been implemented in organization A and there was an increase in its organizational performance. If you use this evidence to decide that you will implement the program in your organization, such a decision is risky. Why? Because the evidence is quite weak. Program Y is consistent with an improvement in organizational performance, but the evidence does not rule out other factors that can lead to improved organizational performance. Maybe a narcissistic, micro-controlling team leader was on a family or medical leave. Maybe team members had less dreadful meetings, so they have time to get real work done. These factors have nothing to do with the program of interest. In law, this type of evidence is considered as circumstantial evidence. In science, there are rigorous scientific methods that are used to produce evidence. When researchers publish their evidence, they are expected to provide publishers and readers with detailed methods in a way that other researchers can replicate the research process. Peer reviewers also evaluate whether the methods used to generate valid evidence are appropriate and rigorous. You want to know the extent of racial bias in your organization. You send out a survey to each employee asking them, do you have racial bias? Not many people will admit that they have racial bias. The evidence you get is very weak and misleading. Why? Because people have social desirability bias. We tend to give answers that are socially desirable. When was the last time you see a person admits he or she had racial bias? You are more likely to see people talk about racial and gender biases when they are on the receiving end. So using a survey to directly ask whether people have racial bias is not a rigorous method. How to measure racial bias? Some researchers give decision makers different scenarios. The only difference in the scenario is people's names. The first name reveals gender, the last name implies racial background. Since people's names are the only difference in those decision making scenarios, the difference in decision making outcome may suggest racial and gender bias. Another way to measure racial bias is to use implicit association test, which measures how strong people associate different groups with stereotypes. There are many ways to measure racial bias. 
Are these existing measures perfect? Of course not. Scientists have known that the order in which questions are asked on a survey can change how people respond. To minimize such an effect, scientists usually change the order of questions between respondents. Hoping to cancel out the effect, but recently scientists argue that this effect of the first measure influencing people's responses to the next one can be precisely and explained by a quantum-like aspect of people's behavior. Scientists are always exploring new methods and innovative ways to measure a construct and produce evidence. To find strong evidence, not the weak one, you'll need to go to trustworthy, reputable sources to find the evidence. Vague, untraceable sources should ring alarm bell. When you hear people say "research says" or "scientists say" without further details or citing sources, you'd better ask follow-up questions. This is because people can have very loose definition of science and research. Not all research is created equal. The research published in reputable journals carries more credibility than a one-page report you find on an obscure website. The sixth thing leaders need to know about evidence-based decision making is that experts are not immune to judgment errors. Have you heard the saying there are three kinds of lies: lies, damned lies, and statistics? The saying was popularized by Mark Twain. The origin of the phrase can be traced to journal Nature in November 1885. Here is the quote: "A well-known lawyer, now a judge, once grouped witnesses into three classes: simple liars, damned liars." And experts. He did not mean that the expert uttered things which he knew to be untrue, but that by the emphasis which he laid on certain statements, and by what has been defined as a highly cultivated faculty of evasion, the effect was actually worse than if he had. Let's go back to confirmation bias. We all have confirmation bias, but people with stronger logical analytical skills are more susceptible to the confirmation bias. The greater our cognitive capacity, the greater our ability to rationalize and interpret information to support our existing beliefs. When the evidence supports an opposing view, people with better logical and analytical skills are more likely to come up with a counterargument that further strengthens their original view. This is known as the boomerang effect. Contradictory information does not make someone open-minded, but rather causing people to double down on their original belief. In addition to confirmation bias and the boomerang effect, experts are more vulnerable to the overconfidence bias than lay people. Overconfidence bias is people's tendency to have overconfidence in their skills. People are confident when they know what they are talking about. Experts obviously know a lot in their domain. Experts are not immune to judgment errors and biases. Even worse, they are sometimes more vulnerable to judgment errors and biases. The accuracy and reliability of expert opinion can be compromised by a long list of biases, such as affect bias, loss aversion, confirmation bias, the boomerang effect, and the overconfidence bias. Experts' knowledge does not make them immune to those biases. A highly regarded expert with a proven record in one field might make the same inaccurate prediction as someone who is new on the topic. But experts are more likely to be convinced they are right. 
When we identify ourselves as experts, we become reluctant to admit our mistakes and failures. Our ego are attached to being smart and the best in our knowledge domain. We distance ourselves from those who have less knowledge than us. This psychological distance makes us difficult to earn people's trust. We might also be afraid that non-experts and outsiders outsmart us. Over time, the very expertise that leads to our success can make us overconfident, ignorant, and arrogant. The false sense of expertise can, in turn, lead us to feel that we have the license to be more close-minded in our views. If you have experts presenting evidence, don't be starstruck. Their long list of publications, awards, and achievements do not necessarily lend credibility to the evidence relevant to the decision at hand. Their self-assurance and assertiveness may make them overconfident in their judgment. If you are an expert, you are not immune to judgment errors. The seventh thing leaders need to know about evidence-based decision making is that beware the information bias. Sometimes more evidence is not always better. This sounds counterintuitive. All of us usually have a tendency to seek evidence when it does not influence our decisions. This tendency is called information bias. We tend to overvalue information in general, and particularly in high-stakes decision-making. High stakes increase our curiosity in the information, even when the information has no effect on our decisions. We seek information based not only on its actual benefit, but also on the anticipation of its benefits. How much time is sufficient for humans to use facial appearances to judge people's traits such as competence and trustworthiness? A hundred milliseconds, that's one-tenth of a second. Here is a true or false question. The more time it takes for us to judge people's traits from their facial appearances, the more accurate our judgment is. The correct answer is false. Why? The more time we have to make a decision, the more confidence we have in our decision. But additional time only boosts our confidence, but does not increase accuracy of our decision. If we don't need much information to reach a decision, then why do we keep seeking information before making a decision? It turns out seeking new information can be addictive. We sometimes cannot stop asking for more evidence even when we are not expecting anything new from the evidence. Blame our brain. Information acts on the brain's reward system in the same way as financial rewards, food, and drug. For example, food, either nutritious food or junk food, activates the brain regions that are part of the dopaminergic reward system. The dopaminergic reward system produces dopamine, making us have pleasurable feelings. But it does not tell whether the system trigger is good or bad, like nutritious food or junk food, painkiller or addictive drug. Information triggers our brain's dopaminergic reward system in a similar way, no matter how useful the information is. Just like our brains overvalue nutrition from junk food, our brains overvalue information that makes us feel good but may not be useful in our decision making. Just like we tend to be addictive to drugs and comfort food which triggers a surge of dopamine, we tend to be addictive to information which triggers our dopaminergic system in the same way. 
Seeking more evidence can give us a sense of control. This feeling leads to an overestimation of the instrumental value of information. We may believe that information about potential outcomes will enable us to take action to change those outcomes, when in fact, outcomes are beyond our control. As a result, people may overpay in terms of money, time, or some other currency for useless information, creating excessive paperwork in organizations. Here is a question. In reality, how much evidence do you need before casting your ballot in an election? Remember, we are not talking about how much evidence do you need in an ideal world. We are talking about reality. In the real world you live in, how much evidence do you need before casting your ballot? You know the answer. In this video, we talk about what evidence is. Numbers and metrics can be deceptive. Text can be emotional contagious. We also talk about seven things leaders need to know to make evidence-based decisions. They are, number one, no evidence has 100% certainty. Number two, evidence can be cherry-picked. Number three, evidence can be distorted. Number four, the same evidence can be interpreted differently. Number five, not all evidence is created equal. Number six, experts are not immune to judgment errors. And number seven, beware the information bias. Hopefully, this video will help you become more evidence savvy. What are your thoughts about evidence-based decision making? Is there anything I missed about evidence? Please share it in the comments below. I'll see you next time.